Mahendra Singh lives in Mumbai and ever since he moved to the city, he had to do commission work to make his living and support the work he personally liked doing most for himself. This commission work was news photography and editorial reportage, which was published in magazines like Time, Newsweek, Paris Match, Geo, The New York Times, etc. He emphasizes that he had this distinct clarity ever since he began doing photography, that taking pictures the way he liked was most important to him. And he has been doing that ever since. His work has been shown in various galleries and museums internationally. Mahendra Singh Ji. Hello, everyone. I'd first like to thank very much Prashant and Dinesh, Delhi Photo Festival, who has invited me here. I'm really thankful. And also the entire Delhi Photo Festival team and Devika Adolat Singh. Here I would share something, an observation that in 1979, as early as that, I went to attend the Convention of Photography in Venice, which ran for about three months, and arguably is one of the biggest convention ever held in the world for photography. The ICP, the UNESCO, and the Municipality of Venice were the sponsors, and there was a hell of a lot of money to support the whole three-month affair. All the biggest names in photography in the world Anyone you can think of had either their exhibitions, and those who were living were conducting workshops, or showing the work, or talking. So it was an incredible experience. I was in Venice for about two months for that. But when I saw the Delhi Photo Festival, this is my first time, and I saw this, I saw, saw its scale, and I realized this whole enthusiasm it has generated, which we see all around. And the other day, which is unbelievable, and what I saw at the opening of Robert Be uh, show, uh, Roger, Roger Bellin's show, I never thought in my life I'll be seeing this day that uh, photography in my country would be so well received by such a huge number of people and enthusiasts and students. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I would like to say that uh, what we're seeing here today or last few years at Photo Festival and what I saw at the Vikas Gallery is we are seeing a history in the making. Before I begin my pictures, I am not very good at talking. I would like to say a few things which probably would explain what I am, what I do, and why I do it. Why I do photography is, I think, is the best thing I can do. And how I got into it is that I thought about it and I realized that from a very early childhood, I had a tremendous ability to remember things visually. My earliest memories when I dug my recess of a mind deep, I remember that when I was in fourth class, my mother taught me and we were living in a village because there was no school there. So to appear for the fourth grade examination, I was sent to a school close by in a neighboring village, which is about four kilometers away. And uh, never in my life I was woken up at five o'clock, and that must have been eight or nine years old then. And we had a couple of cars, but they were very low slang, not fit to run on the kacha track where the village was. So I was in a small bullock cart with the crafts and cartmen, I was dispatched in the morning in that total darkness. And on the way somewhere, I mean, it was quite an experience, and somewhere on the way, the dawn break slowly. By and by, the whole landscape came alive. And all the shrubs, all the dried grass, 
the black cotton soil of Malwa region that is, and the huge 50, 60, 80 year old trees with the silhouettes looking very ghostly and dark emerged as the darkness gave way to morning light. Other memories is, are when I came and we shifted to Ujjain, the town where I was born. I used to walk to the school and there were two, three ways of walking up there to the school. I could remember so vividly, I could really count my steps and the images that I uh, conjured up in my mind. Like for example, I can never forget one lane which I used to love to take, where a lot of Maharashtrians lived. And at one particular turn, and there would be hardly people on the road at that early hour in the morning. That particular turn always fascinated me because it had a tall building and narrow lane and balconies. But on this plain facade of this yellowish, ochre yellowish, Italian kind of yellow, at the turn, I'll see a poster put very high up. And I still vividly remember it was film Sharda with Raj Kapoor and Meena Kumari, I think. So details like this and the whole morning life in the lanes which unfold in front of me, people doing their morning rituals. So I have very, very sharp memories of those days. And I think that is one factor I think I can say was a visual side to me, which eventually I think I've come to think of it led me into photography. Then when I, we moved into Jain and I studied science and I did a master's in science and uh, I was not interested in uh, studies at all, but because I had nothing to do, so I continued with MSc. And uh, I used to cycle to my university and very reluctant to go to the class, very boring. On the way, I'll see these swaying fields on both sides. And I'll wear towards, instead of going to my class in the university, I'll wear towards the university library where we used to get some magazines like Life and Look very surprisingly on Jain that time. So I'll sit for hours. The librarian became a good friend, and he'll give me the old issues. I turned them over and over again so many times. They all became like falling, they were falling apart and dog-eared. And I think that was one of my biggest education, looking at Life magazine, the pictures laid out so huge, and double spreads, and all that report, best reportage of 60s and 70s. Then there was a friend of mine in Ujjain, luckily. Ujjain is a very small place, and uh, he luckily happened to be son of the vice chancellor there, and he subscribed to head interest in photography too. That was very lucky to some photographic journal, and that was my another exposure, and we will talk photography 24 hours a day. And I mean, as much time we could spend together. And after that, you know, I finished my master's. I, it became a big question what you'll do. Everybody would ask. My parents, of course, very worried, friends, relatives. So I had to actually somehow there to think or some route to escape and do something, but I had no idea what I'll do in life. Luckily, in the last two years that I was doing my master's, I picked up one day my father's brownie, box camera, and I took some pictures which surprised everyone because they were rather nice. And success of these initial few rolls of films and all the applause I got, praise I got, convinced me that I must <clears throat> take up photography seriously. And I think it was a very revolutionary idea in 1971 when I came to Bombay alone without knowing anyone except one friend of that, that idea for that time. I landed up in Bombay and uh, I straight away had to find a way to fend myself because I was determined I will not tax my parents to send me money, but which had to be done for a couple of years. There used to be a magazine that I used to subscribe called Junior Statesman JS. 
And JS was for that time, if any one of you know, was quite a revolutionary path-breaking magazine for the youth and it's the time of the hippism. And I used to like that very much and I chased Desmond Doig whenever he came to Bombay office to give me some work and eventually I got some work there and I started visiting the office almost every day. But whilst I was in Ujjain and through these photographic magazines, I had seen uh, Raghuraya's work even before I, I thought, imagined I will do photography one day seriously, oh, full time. And then it was a pleasure to know delightful news that uh, Raghuraya worked for the statesman. So in Bombay office, the statesman will come, the daily. So I'll wait every Sunday to see Raghuraya's picture, half page they used to give him. And very excitedly, one day eventually I met him when he was visiting Bombay and it was a very short meeting. Eventually we became very good friends, very, very close friends. But the turning point in my life came in 1976 when I met Raghuveer Singh after seeing his book Ganga. And uh, I had no idea who this man was and then someone told me his antecedents. He was from Jaipur. And at Common Friends Place he happened to stay because he was shooting his monumental book, Rajasthan, which he himself considers one of his best works. So we were in a village fair and uh, the person he was staying with gave me a lift to the fair and on the return, obviously, I got a lift back. And Raghubir, I was introduced to Raghubir, and he would not much talk to me. And eventually, he asked me when he dropped me that, uh, what kind of photography you do, and whom do you like, and which are your favorite photo who whose photography you like. So I rattled out some names like Eugene Smith, Katia Bresson, and some other color photographers of the 60s like Ernst Haas, Pete Turner, he said all rubbish. <laughs> he said except, except Bresson, everything is rubbish. He said instead of Eugene Smith, you ought to be seeing Eugene Edre's work. I didn't know who Edre was and how he was spelt. But then he was very serious and then uh, he gave me some bit of good advice and uh, he said, this way you're not going to reach anywhere unless you educate yourself. Read a lot as much as you can. What books you have photography? Then he gave me address of S. Paul Raghu's elder brother that he's a good friend of mine whenever you visit Delhi. See, he has many books. Then he wrote down, standing on the road for me, all the books I should immediately say, see, including, I remember, John Sarkarsky's... Uh, the photographer's uh, eye and uh, 100 photographs from Museum of Modern Art, looking at photographs is the name of the book, which eventually he came and gave me as a gift on his next trip. He used to call, looking at photographs of Sarkarsky, who was a director at the time of Museum of Modern Art, he considered, he called it a Bible for me, a photographic Bible. He said it's a Bible for photographers, which I realized how much, what he meant by saying that. He says that I should read, be reading history by Beaumont Newhall and N.C. Newhall, Sarkovsky, of course, and some critics in New York Times like, I forget his name now. Uh, so that really was the turning point of my life, meeting Raghubir Singh. And when I was doing when all that was going on, remember that was no, there was no internet, there was no availability or easy accessibility to these photographic books at that time. So even to get films to shoot, color film, was a big, huge problem because I used Kodachromes. And many times the stock won't be there and then it will be expired. I mean, not well-kept stock with the photo dealers. And then to get good processing, if you were doing some serious work, it had to be sent abroad. So all these odds and availability of camera equipment and things, I must say, the Gurai till today had helped me quite often with gifting me cameras which he has, which came very useful in my work. So I'm going to show you a few samples of my work. It was uh, a few 
about four or five of them. And uh, first one of them was the th desert in Rajasthan. I shot in the 80s, Thar Desert, which began as an assignment for the German magazine, German edition of Geo, Geo they call it. And I was so fascinated by this land because of its beauty, the vastness, the harshness. And I'm originally Ashton, my family comes from Rajasthan about three, four hundred years ago, but I have any relations there, so I have a special connection with Rajasthan. But Western Rajasthan is something very special. One thing which drawn me more towards it was the people were very different, very beautiful. Uh, the spaces were enormous, and the whole area itself is very difficult to shoot because it's thousands of square kilometers, very sparsely populated. Uh, Jaisalmer itself is, one of, I think, considered one of the, is world's one of the biggest uh, district area-wise, and the ratio of population is very low. My biggest problem in the desert, very quickly, was that it's very difficult to shoot it was very expensive. I, for the first few years, I took uh, lifts with great difficulty from BSF, from the army, other security forces. Then Mahindras gave me a jeep for a couple of times. Then eventually I got my own jeep, but being a petrol fuel was very expensive. I had no money. Then luckily in between I got a Times of India fellowship and a, major grant, not major, but fairly large chunk of money from uh, Tata and uh, Dorabji, Sir Dorabji Tata Trust Endowment. So here are some, I begin with Thai Desert. Yeah, one more thing I li like to add that despite of this area, which everyone knows and looks so photogenic and is, it's very, very difficult to shoot there because um, almost nothing happens in front of the camera. You'll wonder why, because most people, male folk go for work very early in the morning in the field or wherever. Women folk remain, women remain inside the house cooking and looking after the household jobs, work. So what do we shoot? I mean, I'm not joking. This is my biggest problem. And then only during some festivities and festivals or marriages, there'll be some congregation and that gave me some rare opportunity to do that. How do I... Yeah, so I continued till 95, 10 years on and off. And I have more pictures, but these are some. This was about a kilometer and a half from Pakistan border. This is a well in the ground which remains locked because the water should, could not be steeled. The wells there are 250, 300 feet deep, so it's so common. Later on, the bore wells came, whole scenario changed, the social structure and fabric changed because people used to congregate near the well. The wells are operational throughout the night where there's ample water. This is during sandstorm in a village which is nearly enveloped, half enveloped by sand. So the issues of water, the drought, it barely rains about 10, 15, millimeters in some time in a village and sometime four years there will be no rain in certain area. This is an abandoned village a well because, uh, but still operational because bore wells have come there. This site is very rare now, I was lucky because, uh, yeah, the, now you ne can never get, I mean earlier on it was very common or easy to see a herd of say about 200 camels. And they will come from um, sometimes five to six kilometers if there was no water in that village for the livestock to drink. Uh, so this particular flock that I sh uh, group of camels I shot was very lucky coincidence. Nowadays, I'm told that there, no one keeps more than seven or eight or 10 camels at the most. But a very interesting thing here to mention that if even in 200, I mean, a group of 200 camels, there are these guys called Pagis who recognize the pug marks of the 
any of the animal from that herd and looking at pagmar he can tell you which camel, particular camel that is and i actually tried and tested this uh, couple of times and they're never 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 wrong after a gap of uh, i think i went to five years to one village i thought it will help if i showed them, showed them what pictures i shot so i taken some rough prints and uh, I was appalled to see that uh, these villagers went so ecstatic that in, uh, there was another picture of a group of camels standing there, recognized which villager in the village whose camel it is. <laughs> okay, this is uh, my under sample of my work which I did in the 80s. This is the Parsis where I live in Bombay and I didn't particularly shoot them with the idea of shooting them as a project or anything. Mm. I used to do a hell of a lot of street photography, which was very in, I was very interested in. So most of these pictures happened because I, ha I ha happened to be there where there were some Parsis walking. Or many of my friends are Parsis and my wife is a Parsi. So they were done in uh, some friends' households. So it was not like project I began. As you probably all of, all of you know that there are hardly about 65,000 of them are left in Bombay now. And next largest population is in Toronto, Canada. Uh, this is the same convention that I was talking of, Italy. I was there and a few four or five images which I liked from that period. Mm. It's a mistake, it's 79 actually. Uh, this is my newer work, uh, Nature. I'm quite drawn to nature and also music. Uh, Indian classical, Hindustani classical, and Western classical in particular. And I, for many years, have been listening to it, and it's very much part of my being. Uh, in many ways, I realized now that uh, listening to music that seriously has impacted me and my work in many ways. At so many levels, things overlap. Like one of the things which I fully un 
realized was that any serious piece of music you are listening, whether it's Indian classical or Western classical, you have to be absolutely like there in the present moment and not talking or go in a party or something. And you have to be with it, with the flow of the music that is, grow, um, is progressing. And because there is always a connection in such serious music from one passage that's playing now to what is following or what will follow later. And in the similar way, I realized that with that kind of discipline and uh, quietness, quite, uh, what do you call it, uh, approach, whether I'm shooting on the streets or especially in the nature. In nature, I'm not interested in making pretty pictures, but uh, more complex it is, more uh, difficult it is for me, I enjoy it more. Mm, in fact, I have not included uh, quite some pictures here because they are probably a little too abstract and they're not corrected. So in music, when you're listening to it so quietly, often there will be passage or passages in, in any class Western classical, Indian classical, which will, be, which will delight you beyond point. Uh, I mean, these are the moments of what you call rapture. And the same thing which I was telling you that is giving you the simile in uh, forests or nature. Walking, I realized that if you are quiet and meditative and progressing in that direction with that approach, often these moments of rapture happen visually as well. And like a lot of music, I come to realize that which is which be very difficult and beyond my understanding in earlier days, like especially some composers, Western composers. Now, I don't find it so difficult. And a similar thing in nature, mm, I used to admire work of, uh, and still do, uh, Lee Friedlander a lot. But in the early 70s, when I came to Bombay, I saw Friedlander's work, and I could not understand and make a head and tail out of it. But they were in a very prestigious, glossy magazine and a very famous one. So I was really very pained that why, what is in it that it doesn't uh, connect, I don't connect, or I, don't, I can't decipher it. But then my common sense said that there must be something in it which is for which they are here in this magazine. And it took me about 10 more years to go gaga, gaga over it. And uh, same thing happened to me with Friedlander's Pictures of Nature when we saw it, I saw it first. Not his later, later book called The Desert Scene, but much before that, he has done some work in Japan and things. So here is this work. Again,
I'm very influenced by French painter Henri Rousseau. Yeah, this is uh, again work which is all assorted and which is in sort of progression. This is a series on swimming pools.
pictures because I very interested in cooking. I cook almost every day for the last 20 years. So it's a larger part of larger city. Uh, I was cooking one day, I suddenly stumbled upon and looked into my kitchen sink <laughs> and I found it. What was happening there was always very different every day at lunch time or dinner time, and it was always sometimes very interesting. So, these are some pictures from my sink in the kitchen, shot with a phone camera. Well, that's about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry I forgot to thank all of you for coming to this evening. Thank you so much. Manji, it's an absolute joy to see your work. Thank you. You know, I, from observing your work, you mm. know, I saw two distinct strains emerging. Mm -hmm. There is uh, intense uh, engagement with people. Where you, you know, you are very involved in shooting the people that you do, especially in your Parsi's work. And there is a very silent, uh, you know, line and form work that is happening. Detest. You know, almost still life quality. Mm -hmm. There is abstraction there. And these two are completely two different animals, you know. I'm very curious to know how do you straddle both these boats at the same time? Uh, well, I would say it's a natural um, progression when you say that I was very close and up close to people. I'm equally up close to my kitchen sink, uh, you know, really because there's uh, so much detail there and uh, I'm afraid this projection doesn't show it to full detail. Uh, but still, I think not bad. But uh, and there, I've still not worked on imagery because they can be sometimes slightly sharpened the way I saw it them. So my we are looking, or I only, or we all only shoot what we are attracted to. So when I was shooting people on the street, you know, it's a very different thing because you have to be very very quick. Mm, that kind of street photography trend uh, from the time of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 50s uh, has been done so much and uh, you see again I will bring in music because uh, I used to early on listen to all Indian masters then slowly I started getting bored with a lot of instrumental music except Ali Akbar Khan and probably with the exception of Vilayat Khan Oh, sorry, um, Nikhil Banerjee. But nowadays I find myself and no one, I have not made a decision like that, but I listen to about 80% of time 
vocal music and out of that 80% 90% time i'm a great admirer and devotee of uh, kumar gandhar because i feel that his music was ahead of our times he was a musician still at this time and age is ahead of today because he was very different musician in the same given the same parameters or uh, vocabulary of indian rigid vocabulary of indian cl rigor, uh, classical music indian classical music so i realized that sometimes when i listen to music say for an hour half an hour alone how so great the compositions are of course most of them are classic will last forever like mandelson beethoven bach the famous compositions and also indian masters rendition particular bandishes but other music i sometimes find and i'm not talking something very big from a small mouth of mine but uh, i started getting bored with certain kind of music which i used to like very much earlier on so i suppose the same thing happened to me with street photography and uh, i didn't make any decision it uh, just happened on its own suddenly one day that i found myself slowly shooting pictures where there less people or no people in the pictures uh, lately in color you must have seen some people but this is a very different take so to answer your question yes there are two different worlds but in both of them your uh, approach doesn't for my approach i think doesn't change uh first thank you for this incredible master class in poetry and photography i think this is uh very very important for so many photographers and also thank you so much i met you 11 years ago with jaru ma'am i studied under her and yeah. you gave me a very very important tip which i still try to practice today which is to not weigh your mind down because of your camera bag uh, i think that's incredible uh, i think part of the question vandeep already asked which i wanted to ask you uh, the other thing i noticed is that you have incredible form which i i just really have not seen form. in so many pictures that i've seen every day but what is even more beautiful is that you let the viewer get trapped in the form but let yet leave enough space for them to go wherever they need to within the image and then come back to what is so essential to the core of the image how do you work that in your mind and i mean what what goes into what because i think it's in, incredible it's, it's it's incredibly modern work i haven't seen work like that in color thank you so much uh I don't know I mean my work is soft and it's a little or lyrical or, or you could call it on the edge of being little poetic uh but I mean some of my work is uh, I don't know if I can get back to that but there's a was picture shot in Chomela Mahal in Hyderabad where you see the light old, old light switches inside a cupboard and except for a very intelligent people visual and visual intelligent people Mm, i found very few people who react to that uh, image ye kya hai you know what is it uh i don't think my work is very modern uh, by my own standards and i am not so young so well i moved a long distance from thar desert days as you could see and probably and i am not i have not stopped but uh and i am uh, keep my ears and eyes open so it does happen that like again i fall back to music uh, i don't think what is there in particular which appeals to many people i don't know how many people it appeals to but most of my friends and people i share with seem to like what i do and sometimes they don't but it's like music that uh, there's why there's so many hindi songs bollywood songs only certain songs become hits because obviously they have a fairly good combination of uh, lyrics music um, beat whatever you call it and quality which appeals to people so i suppose it's the same uh, i am inspired by your work and i am 11th class student and i just wanted to ask is it always important for a photographer to be a storyteller <laughs> well yeah yeah good question i think yeah It's a good question, yeah, and very relevant one at that. 
I like to show my pictures to a lot of people who are uninitiated or who are not used to seeing pictures like this. Uh, may it be someone I'm traveling and I'm staying with, and they have nothing to do with photography of this kind, and many such people. And even uh, some of my pictures which they saw and reacted to had no people in them, surprisingly, but they said, you have a lot of stories in there. So I really fail to understand what they mean by there are a lot of stories in it. You, like you said, I suppose they mistake the details in that particular four frames. So much is happening, you know, like in my sorted work I showed you, which is in progress. Uh, there are many worlds in there, you know. Uh, Maybe the picture is in the garden, or maybe the picture is on the roadside of some rubble lying. So storytelling, of course, is very important if you're doing picture features for a, a newspaper or magazine kind of story point of view. In that sense, of course, yes, that helps. And you should have a very good idea of a story's progression, I mean, the beginning, middle, and the end. So when I used to do news photography for almost 15 years for CIPA Press in Paris, I did some picture stories for them, but not so much. Most of it was news photography. But even if you're going to shoot a news event, uh, you should have a fairly good idea that how this story developed, what happened, and what repercussions it will have. So that, that in itself is also kind of uh, following a Lee line of a story in some way. Yeah. Sorry. So this is not really a question, but more a comment. Hmm. Uh, for someone who I've known last 35 years. Thank you. So, simple question. No question. <laughs> I just want people to know in this room that, uh, according to me, you're seeing probably one of the greatest photographers India has ever, ever, ever seen. And thank you for... <laughs> thank you so much. I thank you for coming I on out, man. Honestly, don't think I deserve it. You're so way ahead of your time, man. Yeah. And... Thank all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nano. Thank you. If we can take one more question, sir. One more in case there's anyone. Uh, because that wasn't a question. That was a statement we all agree with. So, <laughs> Anyone has a question? Thank you. No? All right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, please, Vivan. Vivan. I was very intrigued by saying that one of your favorite artists is Henri Rousseau. Mm -hmm. Because the sensibility of your work, right. and obviously sometimes you can like somebody who's very different, mm. and there is a kind of very exquisite lyrical, poetic abstraction in your work. Thank you. And uh, Rousseau, you know, has kind of very dense frontality and the visual texture of his picture. Right. I'm very curious to know why Rousseau and why not some impressionist painter or some I'm glad you asked abstract, that. abstract painter. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, among the Renaissance painters, and uh, coming to Rousseau, uh, when I first saw his work, uh, in fact, uh, Himmer Shah's place, a sculptor, a friend of ours, uh, what struck me was that he created his own world by, and then I read about it, and he created a world in the forest by juxtaposing different foliage which didn't belong to the terrain. So like something which is growing in subtropical region, he would place it along with uh, rainforest. Uh, something in coastal region, palms suddenly will appear somewhere. Then of course, amidst this foliage, he also had a figure embedded there, you know, which was not, many people criticize him, criticize him at his time that were not prospectively correct. Because Rousseau, as you know, used to work as a, um, check post, you know, the river ferry. But Picasso was also fascinated by his work and most people rejected him and, and then when Picasso loved him and uh, publicly spoke about it, him, he sort of became more known. So to answer your question, I think, uh, as I had said earlier, that I'm not happy if I go to a situation and, you know, it's very difficult to shoot forests because the best forests in India are like san in sanctuaries. And because so much of poaching happens, you know, like they're very wary of strangers and outsiders. Uh, my idea is not to 
disturb one leaf, but to convince them what I'm doing is very difficult. So, and you believe you me, you have to sometimes walk for days and days and days. Uh, you will not get a picture which will make you happy or satisfy you. So this, uh, there are some pictures of Karnataka sanctuary which I suddenly found on the road when I was dri driving. There's moss and a lot of, uh, uh, you know, network, uh, foliage like intertwine, intertwine. It looks easy after, as we see it. But to me, it reminds me of Rousseau because Rousseau used to do the same in his paintings. There's the only painter of nature I've seen who used to juggle all this and get away with it in such a nice way. Thank you. Thanks.